And here we go. Hello and welcome to the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is a photographer, best selling author, and educator who has been teaching photography for over 40 years in colleges, universities, and workshop centers in the US and internationally. He is currently a professor and co director of Pacific New Media Foundation in Honolulu, Hawaii. His work has been published in numerous books and journals, including Aperture, Manoa, and Sierra Club publications. His photographs have been in 75 exhibits internationally. He blogs about creativity and consciousness and is a consulting editor and frequent contributor for Parabola magazine. He is the author of several books, including The Widening Stream, The Seven Stages of Creativity, and most recently, Zen Camera. Creative Awakening with a Daily Practice in Photography. Welcome to the show, David Ulrich. Thank you, Matt. I'm very excited to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, man, me too. You know, I got um, introduced to you through one of the networks or something, and I got to look at the book. I personally love photography, um, so I'm excited to learn. And I actually didn't know until reading the bio that you had another book called The Widening Stream, The Seven Stages of Creativity. And um, personally, just with my background, um, I feel like we should, I should have more artists on the show talking about creativity, art, music, painting, photography, all of these um, different ways because I think they're incredible tools for understanding yourself, understanding the world and growing. So um, why don't you uh, let the audience know a little bit about yourself and how you got to what you're doing today? Well, uh, yes, I have been a photographer ever since I was a child. Strangely enough, my favorite toy when I was two years old was my father's broken camera. <laughs> my parents gave me a camera for Christmas at the age of 11, and I, I felt like I won the lottery of childhood delight. <laughs> and I've been a photographer ever since. Um, along the way, I became interested in how art and creativity can serve our awakening, can serve our our uh, aspirations toward consciousness. And so my principal interest at this point is teaching photography as a means of awareness and a means of becoming more conscious, both of ourselves and of the world around us. Well, I was, uh, I was messing around on Facebook. I thought most oh. of the time people go a little bit deeper. Um, oh, I, can, I can do that. I can yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because usually I'm uh, – sorry. Uh, okay. only, only, only I know this, but at the beginning I do the shares on Facebook and I listen to the whole background. But, yeah, well, 40 years of – Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story that really okay, cool. um, is key to understanding my, my mission, if you will. I was a student at Kent State in 1970. Um, that's the semester when – the shootings took place on May 4th, 1970. Hmm. Um, I was a photojournalist student and I was covering a demonstration. Uh, students were protesting president Nixon sending troops into Cambodia. So the demonstration was festive. There were children. It became violent overnight. Uh, some of the students burned down the ROTC building and the governor called in the national guard the next day. So the demonstration continued about halfway through the morning. Uh, the national guard formed a, a line, uh, two people deep and they fired 30 caliber armor piercing bullets directly into the crowd of students. Four students were shot and killed. Numerous others were wounded. It was really the first time as far as I know that American troops shot on civilians on American soil since the Civil War. And that had a very, very deep impact on me. Um, I was a journalism student and my professors were teaching me to try to be impartial, to try to present the facts without opinion, which I think is a very, very valid aim for journalism. But what happened with me is I felt uh, tremendously moved. I'd never been in contact with death before, much less my own peers. And it really made me realize that violence and polarization in any way isn't really going to help change society. The only real change can come, needs to come from the inside out. 
and that a, uh, an expansion of consciousness was the only change that can make a difference in our lives as human beings today. And I intuited at the time that art and creativity could help in that process. So that was a really decisive shift in my movement away from photojournalism to becoming an artist and to using photography and creativity as a means to heighten awareness and expand consciousness. So that's really the, the, the crucible of where my current ideas and writing come from. Holy smokes, man. Well, I'm really glad that I got you to go a little bit deeper. That's intense. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, it was well, pretty intense. Well, I love, the, I love the root core of the intention. So maybe you can help guide the conversation in the sense of like you've written two books. How do we – maybe – I'm sure it goes beyond photography, but maybe you can speak on how we can use this tool to expand our consciousness to, to use it as a tool. You know, I think any, any tool, any life activity, if approached in the right way, can be a path toward awakening. Um, you know, Zen masters would use archery, swordsmanship, pottery as a way of awakening awareness. In the modern times, I think that um, any activity that you engage in deeply can become a path toward awakening. You know, you wrote a book called Zen Athlete. I think that physical activities can certainly assist in that process. In my case, I feel photography is particularly powerful because when you're with a camera and you're out in the world, you really have to be in the moment. I mean, that's the definition of photography. You have to be paying attention. If you're diddling around on your phone, if you're thinking about what you're gonna do for dinner or last night's date, um, you're going to miss the unfolding moment in front of you. So the very first lesson, I think, of photography is that it teaches us to be present. It teaches us to have an undivided attention. And I think what's even more interesting about photography is that our responses to the world don't take place out there in the world. They take place in here. So we need to have a kind of mindfulness we need to be aware of our own responses, our own reactions, our own body, our own senses, our own feelings, at the same time that we're paying attention to the world itself. So I think this dual awareness that photography engenders is the kind of inward attention that we seek in traditions like Zen that help us become more whole, more present, and more aware. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And I really like the idea of, um, you know, the Zen master thing. I relate to any kind of martial art, but anything that you try to master, you can find like, I don't know about the answers, um, but you will, you will find a greater awareness um, about yourself, the universe. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be knitting for all you. If you want to master anything, um, what it will take to master that you're going to learn more about everything. So I totally agree. And I think um, photography will be such a wonderful avenue for that. Do you want to speak some it specifically about how photography um, would help with that or just the creative practice? And I'm curious about the seven stages of creativity because I know that there's a lot of artists, musicians, um, people that listen on the podcast would probably value that information. Let me start with the seven stages of creativity because I think that's fundamental. When I was 21, I read a book, and it was called The Creative Process, and it was a series of essays by about 75 people, artists, scientists, musicians, mathematicians, and I read this book, and I thought to myself, holy cow, they're all saying the same thing. They were all talking about definable stages in any creative act. So let's break them down for just a minute. What's the very first thing you need to do if you want to be creative? You have to find a medium. You have to find a tool, something that is aligned with your temperament, with your being. You know, I hear people say in school to children, oh, you can do anything. You know what? I will never, ever be a great football quarterback. <laughs> I will never, ever be a lineman or a center on a basketball court. 
I don't have the body type. I don't have the temperament. I think that what we need to find is an activity that we feel inwardly aligned to that we have the temperament and the body type for, so to speak. So finding a medium is really the first step in, in the creative process. And then along with that is discovering something about who we are and what we have to say. I call the first stage discovery and encounter. We discover our medium. We discover something of what we have to say. And we begin. You know, we really have to encounter a medium in order to grow in it and in order to do anything in it. The second stage is what I call passion and commitment. As with any activity, I think in the arts, um, obsession is actually a good thing. In traditional life, you know, normal life, we see obsession as being creepy or bad, but artists become obsessed with their themes. They become obsessed with their vision, their voice. And I think this passion is very akin to the sexual act. There's a lot of sexual generative, generative I'm sorry, generative energy in this stage. So we, we find passion, we find commitment, and the work really picks up steam and discoveries at this point seem to emerge out of the atmosphere itself. Then comes stage three that we're all very much aware of. I call that crisis and creative frustration. You face the blank page. You face the blank painting. Your initial impulse has been expended. You've gone as far as you can go and you feel a deep frustration. Many people give up at this stage. So what are the options? The first option is taking the macho approach. I can try to bulldoze my way through. The second option is to take the poor me approach. I can sit back and wait for somebody to come and rescue me. Or the third option is to try to find a new perspective. Try to find an expanded perspective where you really can look at the work and understand that it's incomplete. And you need to put the question in the back of your mind and allow it to percolate, allow the unconscious to cultivate the question that you're facing. Stage four is retreat and withdrawal. You move back, you know, in any argument between people. As soon as you take a break, you walk outside for a breath of fresh air, you go get a drink of water, you often come back with a new perspective. So I think in the retreat and withdrawal stage, we put the working question and we, we plant it in our unconscious and we allow for digestion and we allow for, um, for growth that takes place under the surface. Stage five is probably the most exciting in the creative process. It's called epiphany and insight, what we call the aha moment. Do you know how Einstein discovered creativity or discovered um, the theory of relativity? It's a fascinating story. He was working for months on a mathematical equation, on a physical question that had to do with the relationship between space and time. He was getting nowhere with it. He tried numerous approaches to the question and nothing worked. Finally, one day he threw up his hand and he said, screw it, I'm done. And he went to bed and that night, what appeared in his mind as a visual image was E equals MC squared. So he had to go through all the work. He had to plant the question in the unconscious and then he had to let go. And then the answer just appeared. Many artists talk about this moment of inspiration where something just appeared. I've done enough with athletics to know that there's a moment when you enter a kind of flow, when something bigger than yourself is involved. And it's almost as if another energy is entering you. I don't wanna sound woo woo about it, it's probably from the deeper mind, but it definitely feels like an energy that is beyond what we commonly know. Stage six is um, discipline and completion. 
we have to sit down and do it, finish the task, finish the job. And stage seven is responsibility and release. When we let go of our work, that begins its public journey. That begins its journey with an audience. And I believe artists have responsibilities, that, that their insights are not for themselves alone. So that's sort of a rough guide to the seven stages of the creative process. It's really concise and helpful. Um, I think it's super important too. Like I, it's very encompassing. And I think where a lot of people get stuck in the creative process is making it perfect. Like anything, whether it's music, art, photography, so many people um, that are talented are like, no, I don't want to do that because I'm worried about what people would think. What do you advise for people who kind of get stuck in that kind of mindset where they're, you know, they don't want to create because they're worried about what other people would think, or they don't know if it's good enough, or they don't know if it's ready, or all of those kind of things that they say. I think, I think it's a huge problem. I think that for whatever reason today, many, many people struggle with self-esteem. They struggle with self-doubt. And, you know, there's no way around that except to be like Nike and to just do it. The other way around it is to, to genuinely and literally try to have compassion towards yourself, to recognize that what a creative activity brings you in touch with is your own vision or voice. Once you discover your own uniqueness, I think that goes a long way to, to mitigating self-doubt. So it's not an easy question. You know, um, one of the other aspects of it is, are we pursuing our activity for ourselves alone? Or are we thinking about an audience? When I write a book, I always keep an audience in mind. I feel like I need to be interacting with other people. The other, I think, very important aspect of striving against this desire for perfection is in Zen, there's a, an idea or a concept of what I would call right, rightness. Something is right. It feels right. In the digital world, we call it elegance. So we need to be pursuing our works in such a way that we seek this moment of rightness, this sense of, yes, this feels right. And there's a point where beyond that, it's just um, labored. It's just, uh, you don't need to do anymore. So you need to find that point where it feels right to stop. You know, children are marvelously creative. You look at their drawings and their paintings. I mean, they're powerful. The problem with children's work is they don't know when to stop. They'll do something incredible. Then they'll just keep drawing and painting over it. So what can really help us is the rigor of the adult mind. We need to know um, when do we experience the sense of rightness? Let it go there. Going beyond that is a neurotic striving to perfection. It's hard to know that moment though. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's extremely practical. You know, I like the idea of like, just do it. Um, I think a lot of people get stuck in the thinking stage. You know, they just think about it and think about it rather than just do it. And the right. more you create, the better you're going to get. And it takes time. And if you have never done any art or music, you're going to suck for a bit. That's a part of the process. Um, and you get to learn through practice. The more you practice, the better you'll get. And it's hard to, you know, release your creative work when you are putting your identity on the line. You're kind of like, this is my art and it's meaningful to me. So what is the public going to think? It's a very um, raw thing. You know, it's a very scary thing. There's a really important point here when it comes to inner work and creativity. And that is, we don't work for results. In any inner practice, you know, we're told not to work for results. When I was a young photographer um, and I was starting to teach, I was trying to bring Zen ideas and approaches into the classroom simply and only to help people become better photographers. And my teacher looked at me and she said, 
what serves what? She said, what is lower should never serve what is higher. No, no, she said, what is higher should never serve what is lower. So we need to find the right balance of approach. In other words, I don't pursue Zen or any inner practice in order to become a better photographer or a better person. I engage the process and engaging the process, I learn more about Zen, I learn more about myself. I think what's really, really important for people to understand is that most artists, although they have an eye toward the result, they are fully satisfied being in the moment of the process. The process itself is key. Another one of my teachers, Minor White, the photographer, he had engraved on his tombstone. He felt so strongly about this quote. It was put on his tombstone when he passed away. And it's a quote from St. Teresa. It said, all the way to heaven is heaven. All the way to heaven is heaven. So engaging the process is where the power lies. It's also where the deep satisfaction lies in terms of the creative process. You know, your midwifing energies, you're bringing something into being. You keep one eye on the result, but you really have to stay in the moment, in the process. And that really helps you give up something of this ego attachment to the result. Yeah, man, I totally agree. That's an excellent insight. It's something that I've been kind of sharing pretty consistently. And the example that I use is uh, Alexander Ovechkin. He's this amazing hockey player. Uh, some people are familiar. He's been one of the top hockey players in the NHL for a long time. Finally, after years, he wins the Stanley Cup. That's your pinnacle experience, right? And in life, we have like uh, not so much the golden calf, but kind of, or the carrot on the end of the stick, or something outside of yourself that's going to bring you fulfillment and complete satisfaction, life completion, you know? And so for him or a hockey player or someone striving for a new album, a piece of art, a, uh, uh, an amount of money per year, whatever the case is, he wins the Stanley Cup, right? And that is an amazing accomplishment, but it only lasts like, okay, that night he gets to enjoy that. And then for maybe like a week, he might be super excited. Then maybe the summer they celebrate his stuff, but he's got to go back to the process the next season. He's got to go back to the gym. He's got to go back to his family. He's got to go back to getting groceries. He's got to go back to getting in traffic. He's got to go back to the hard work of game tapes and all that stuff. All of it is process. And I think that, we're conditioned as a society to think about the end goal and just not even think about one process when every single thing is process. And the more that you can master and engage and be aware and present in the process, you're going to have a much better result, but also you're going to learn a lot more and have a much better experience. I totally agree with that. And you know, who really helped me understand that was Phil Jackson the uh, the former head coach of the Chicago Bulls and the LA Lakers. Can I read something to you? It's very cool. Yeah, of course. These are, these are the seven lessons that um, Phil Jackson teaches his players that, that has to do with being in the moment and being in the process. So uh, his first lesson is seek personal mastery. The second lesson is do not hold the ball for longer than two counts. Third lesson, awareness is everything. Fourth lesson, great possibility comes with great danger. And then he goes on to say he's talking about the massive egos that many of these players have. The great possibility comes with great danger. Practice the art of acceptance. Embody compassion. This is an important one. Have a love of the game, yet practice non-attachment. And then finally, strive to understand the soul of teamwork. So I think all of these lessons, which are really derived from Zen, uh, teach us, he's teaching his players how to be in the moment and to not just be thinking about winning, to be in the process, as you're saying. 
Yeah, I'm so so stoked that you had that just sitting there. Those are awesome. I've never heard those. I read The Eleven Rings a while ago, but I did it on – well, I didn't read it. I, I had it on audiobook, so I went through it. So maybe that's why I don't have the notes because usually I take good notes. Um, so I, I'm glad you reminded me of that. But what it makes me think about is – you know, for Zen athlete or one of those concepts that I try to share with kids or people, because the thing is, it's applicable to everybody. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a kid, but especially a kid, because once they have that idea, they can maintain it through life. And the idea is that you do your best, but you got to let go of the result. So you right. do the best process in the same, like when you shoot a free throw basketball shot, you can do the preparation. You can give yourself the positive mindset. You can do the visualization and then it comes down to shooting it. And then as soon as you shoot it, you, it leaves your fingers and now it's not up to you. It's, you've done everything that you could to to prepare for that and you can come back and practice more and more and grow. And it's the same thing in art, photography, music, um, you know, painting. Just do your best in that process, get fully engaged, and you'll evolve your art over time, but you'll learn more about your art, and all, you'll have these insights about life and understanding and move in a more peaceful way as you're just really engaged with something that is engaging you. You know, you're kind of cooperating and um, engaging just with life and creation. You're essentially creating. That's what creativity process is, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're a participant in a moment, and- the, I think the key in what you're saying, and it, it relates back to Zen, is having a fluidity of attention to, to be in this moment, and then this moment, and then this one, and not to be stuck. And as you say, you know, before you take a photograph, just like before you make a, a free throw, you prepare, you try to become present, attentive, and then you flow with life and take pictures and the results will be what they will be. So I think this question of fluidity of attention is so important because we get stuck in our heads. We get stuck thinking about stuff. We get stuck, you know, wanting things to be a certain way rather than being in the moment where all the energy is. So I can't agree with you more. And I think that's the real lesson of photography. The real lesson of photography is to to develop this fluid attention that can allow you to move through the world gracefully with compassion and to have an awareness of the world itself, but also to have an awareness of which pieces of the world are yours to talk about. You know, we can't talk about everything. So the danger with many photographers is when I started teaching photography, this was decades ago, um, people would come up to me and say, I want to learn photography because I want to learn to tell a good story. You know, I'm interested in this or that, and I want to tell a good story. Photography was much more difficult to master in those days. Nowadays, people come up to me and they simply say, I want to learn to take a good picture. And I'm thinking, a good picture of what? You know, photography is a language and you have certain unique characteristics to your being. One of the questions we talk about in the photographic medium is what is my own? You know, what is my area of life? What is my content or story to tell through the medium? And learning to uncover one's own authenticity I think is a major piece of being an artist in any medium. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm laughing because I, I, I agree. And it's like also the most deep and, and maybe challenging pe thing for some people. It's like, how do you know who you are authentically as a human being and express that fully without fear? You know, let's, let's, let's forget about the fear for just one moment and let's get back to how do we know who we are? How do we know our authenticity? Having a medium can really help because it gives us something that can reflect us back to ourselves. When people make pictures, I can tell by the second class whose pictures belong, which pictures belong to which photographer. 
there's a certain orientation. There's a certain way of seeing the world. There's a certain way of handling color or form. I can see something of the seeds of their uniqueness, but they can't see it yet. So many times what is really our own speaks to us in whispers. We go out and take pictures or we write or we make paintings and certain pictures keep calling us back. Certain pictures we keep coming back to, you know, maybe I do a project and one picture from that project stays in my portfolio. Then maybe I do another project and one picture from that project stays in my portfolio. There are certain reflections of ourselves that really do talk about what makes us unique and authentic. And people can learn to see that. And they do learn to see that. And that's very gratifying. You don't have fear when you're engaged in life in the way you need to be engaged. There's a, there's a beautiful Hawaiian word. It's called kuleana. The question is, what is my kuleana? Kuleana means my mission, my duty, my passion, my responsibility. In Western culture, we think of our passion as being diametrically opposed to our duty and responsibility. In Hawaiian culture, those things are united. So can we find the region in life where we can both receive and give? When we find that, it's a humbling experience. And in a very strange way, that humility cuts through fear. I'm really glad you said that. That's, <laughs> that's really that's really deep stuff, man. And I, I completely agree. I don't even know what to say. I'm, I would just want you to keep talking and sharing this wisdom and trying to formulate a question from that. Well, you know, let's talk about the ego for a minute. We all have them. And let's look at the state of photography today. Look at Instagram. What are the dominant kinds of pictures that we see on Instagram? There are selfies, maybe pictures of restaurant food, maybe pictures of our travels. Most of the time, the photographer is saying, look at me, aren't I cool? And we all do need validation. I understand that impulse. But my question is, can it go deeper? Do we judge? who we are based on how we look, whether we were blessed with a perfect body or not. Everybody has something very powerful that is unique to them. When we begin to find that, when we begin to get an inkling of what that is and follow it, um, it's empowering like nothing else is. I have a problem <clears throat> with a lot of parents and teachers. I believe they want what's right for their children. But I also believe that they push them toward excellence. And that's important. But sometimes students need to fail. So in a classroom today, in a, in a primary school classroom, Everybody gets a gold star when they do an activity. Screw that. How are you ever going to know if you're good at something if everybody gets a, a gold star? <clears throat> you know, when I was growing up, in second grade, we played a game with the stock market. We played a game with learning to invest in the stock market. I lost, by far, more money, imaginary money, than anybody else in the classroom. And the teacher looked at me and said, David, you know, you're really not good at this. <laughs> you don't have a feeling for it. And I felt bad, but I forever thanked her for that. How are students going to understand what they're good at, what their own place of genius is, if we pat them on the back equally for every single thing that they do? In fourth grade, in an art class, we were asked to draw a dog. And they wanted us to draw a dog and to paint within the lines. 
And I said, well, screw that. I'm going to paint the dog the way I see the dog. And I got an A in that class. I did better than anyone else. And the teacher said, you know, you're really good at this. You have a feeling for this. So why can't we be more honest? Why does everything have to relate to patting us on the back so that we don't harm our fragile self-esteem? I want my self-esteem challenged if it helps me understand more about who I really am. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And I've definitely heard that um, idea that we have this babying culture um, you know, going around right now and I've seen it and uh, my partner's a kindergarten teacher. So I, I see it here and there. And I think that it, those are important points because it's not to say that you can't learn those other aspects and learn to be good at them if you're not naturally. But what it is saying is what is your unique gift? Who are you? Who are you? Like, are you excited? If you don't like, I wasn't very good at math. Well, I was really good until like grade seven and eight and I lost interest and was not good. Um, I could go for an uphill battle if I wanted to be maybe like an astronaut or something and work towards that. If that like had an end goal that I really wanted, or if I was more naturally inclined to something else and really enjoyed it, was really passionate about it. Um, I could also cultivate that and create a life around that. And that's essentially what I did um, and what I've been doing. And I never understood when university came, how everybody was trying to pick a job. I kind of get it now. Um, and I realized I didn't think like the average Joe, but, um, I was like, well, who do you want to be? I don't want to like, none of these jobs are things that I want to spend my time eight hours a day, 40 days, 40 hours a week. That's crazy. That's my life. Um, so coming back to who we are and really honoring our own authenticity and, and being okay with feedback, whether it's negative or positive, I think are extremely important points. Um, I know in Zen Cram, uh, one oh, thing, and, and yeah, that right. feedback, that feedback can be given with love and kindness. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't remove or mitigate our need to be kind and loving towards children. Yeah, exa exactly. You know, you can say, hey, you, you are going to have to work a little bit harder on this, but you can do it, you know? Right, right. And, you know, hey, you do seem to have a natural ability with this. Do you enjoy it? Would you like to pursue that? You know, you do seem to have an inclination here. Um, exactly. and, if you, and if you sucked at art and you loved it so hard, you could be like, you know what? Great. You got a lot of work to do. Um, but you can be good. Just, you know, go through that process. Um, but you're getting honest interaction. And um, so one thing I was going to ask, because I went over the chapters of the Zen camera book, and I think that it's more of what we're talking about. They're all very good. And I'm sure we could dive deep on any of them. Um, I'm curious if you want to either share an overview or if there's a chapter you'd like to talk about most. That's a good question. Well, let me just <clears throat> go through, you know, like the, I went through the seven stages of creativity. I want to go through the, the six lessons in the book, talk very briefly about them, but then I want to talk a little bit more about the last lesson. The first lesson is observation. I ask my students, <clears throat> how many of you spend at least an hour a day just observing the world? You know, looking around, looking at people, looking at nature, looking at your surroundings, nobody raises their hand. I ask them, how many of you spend at least three hours a day looking at life mediated through some kind of screen? Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody raises their hand. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I think that, you know, we really will become better artists, better writers, better photographers, if we can learn to observe the world. The world has so much to teach us. There's a wondrousness about life, even in our culture today, in America, which is not a very happy one, but there's still power, energy, and a wondrous quality that we can learn through observation. The second lesson is awareness. If observation is the tool, awareness is the capacity. How do we expand awareness? You know, certainly meditation, contemplative activities like yoga, tai chi can really help expand our conscious awareness. The third lesson is identity, and it speaks to the question we were talking about earlier. How do I find my authenticity? 
how do I find my own vision, my own uniqueness? The fourth lesson is practice. You know, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce his name right. Malcolm Gladwell states that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to become good at something. I don't know if that's true or not, but I certainly think it takes everyday work with our medium, with our craft to become good. The next lesson is mastery. How do we master a medium, master a craft? That's not something we do. That's a lifetime engagement. And the sixth lesson is presence. So American culture is drawn to spectacle. Look at the pageantry of football games. Look at the, you know, it reminds me of the Colosseum in Rome. Look at the kind of movies that American culture watches. Loud, ear-splitting, scenes changing like this, lots of violence. American society, and maybe Canadian also, I don't know, seems attracted to things that titillate us, that have a very aggressive impact on us. And even many photographers will um, make pictures that are full of contrast. They take the saturation slider in Photoshop and they turn it all the way up. And there's an unnatural striving for effect. <clears throat> I think the greatest works of art have what I would call presence. Paul Clay, the painter, he would measure the success of one of his paintings by holding up the human hand. If his painting could compete with the livingness of the human hand, he felt that the painting was successful. So I feel that <clears throat> one of the things that's important for us as human beings is to strive toward presence in ourselves, that sense of being in touch with the livingness of our own being, our own body, life exists within me. That's pretty incredible. And the second thing is in what we do <clears throat> to try to create works, try to create things, whatever we create in a way that is truly nourishing to other people, that nourishes something of their deeper selves rather than titillates them. I don't really want to listen to Led Zeppelin all day. I listen to it occasionally but it's too much, you know? I don't need to be blasted. And I would argue that as artists, as communicators, we have a responsibility to feed all aspects of a human being, including the deeper aspects, and to help engender compassion, empathy, to help engender a perspective that can help us genuinely change the world. Uh, one of the things I really wish as a student of creativity. I wish that our political and national leaders, and I mean this the world over, were a lot more creative in the way they approached problems. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of that. Do you wanna, I know that um, you have more chapters. Do you wanna keep going or do you want me to kind of reflect on what you've said? No, those were the six lessons. Um, there's six lessons in the book observation, awareness, identity, practice, mastery, and presence. Oh, okay, cool. I missed I mastery. final chapter. I, I don't always remember the title of it, so I'm going to have to read what that is. The final chapter deals with um, contemporary culture, and its title is Photography and Awakening, The Terrors and Pleasures of Digital Life. <laughs> hmm. Well, well, do you want to speak on that a little bit? Because what my mind thinks about when you say that is just um, what I think society and young people are dealing with right now. You touched on a little bit with Instagram and how that can reflect our ego. All of this stuff is, is really deep um, self-examination. There are real Zen principles in this. How do we come to awareness in a society that's so artificial? People are spending, you know, yeah, go ahead. Well, think about this for a minute. Instagram and Facebook are publishing platforms. You and I and anybody on this earth 
has the capacity now to publish content to a global audience. That is amazing. So in the early days of television, there was a man named Edward Morrow who spoke out against allowing television to become dominated by advertising and spoke about the power of television to reach the people, the people worldwide. And of course, his voice got subsumed by the voice of advertisers. In today's world, I think we're standing on the threshold of a profound revolution. Instagram and Facebook are publishing platforms. Think about that. What if each of us chronicled the effects of environmental damage on our own communities and put them on Facebook? Um, in um, 10 years ago or so, in Middle Eastern countries, people use Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to galvanize themselves, to, to come together as a people. And they use social media to create what was called the Arab Spring, where the people stood up and they ended up toppling um, a number of totalitarian regimes that were in place in Middle Eastern countries. So the power of these platforms can literally change the world. If we think like that, why in God's name would I put primarily selfies on Instagram? There's, you know, think about body positivity. You know, there's so many young people today that have been negatively influenced by media. I have a large number of college students who probably, female college students that probably have eating disorders. Because even though they know consciously that all the models are Photoshopped, unconsciously they take in this image of the perfect body. What if we used Instagram to honor and celebrate everybody, you know, rather than seeking abs or seeking um, to be the thinnest person on the block? So I don't know how it could shape up, but if everybody brought their own creativity to these platforms, I mean, we really could create a movement. I mean, we the people could become a real entity, but I don't think people are thinking like that. Digital technology all too often becomes something that distracts our attention rather than feeds it. I'm going to say one more thing about it, and then I'll turn the tables over to you. One of the things that's really valuable with digital technology is to understand that it's addictive. Alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, there's many things that are addictive, but all of these things have their potent medicinal value. So what would happen if we tried to take the addictive quality of technology and turned it back? to our own self-enrichment. Every now and again, turn it off. Put the phone on airplane mode and put it in your pocket. And even if you feel a craving, that's part of the meaning of Zen. You be with yourself regardless of what you're experiencing. So if we can allow ourselves to resist the flow of technology, it can be a really powerful way to gain inward attention, to gain inward power, so to speak. It's hard to do, I know. <laughs> David, yeah, man, I, I agree with all of those points. I think that with social media, there is an opportunity to do mass good. Um, no. We do have the ability to reach a worldwide audience instantly. And so I think that the way we're using it right now is kind of a uh, little bit of a, a mirror of just how our culture is right it's it's our best foot forward you know we don't see all the behind the scenes you just get that wonderful selfie all, life is fantastic um right. and it's very distracting and mostly destructive um messing with our attention spans and all these kinds of things and at the same time it has a massive potential to do good in which what you're speaking about 
and I've had that same idea as well. What if we could collaborate a little bit more, find these networks, um, use it for social good, mindfulness. Um, you know, you could use your phone like on, on Facebook. One of the things I did when I was like my early 20s, I think, um, I just found all the things I was interested in and it was like positive psychology, sports psychology, mindfulness, um, things like that. And so my feed went from just nonsense to only positive stuff. You can do that on Instagram right now. You can just get rid of all the nonsense and, um, you know, put things that are going to inspire you, that are going to empower you, that are going to bring you back to the present moment. And, uh, and the other thing is like a social media detox realize what it's right. doing. Do you actually need it? You know, yeah. for me, all of my work is on social media and I, and I'm excited about the day when I can hire somebody that's going to handle all this, the things and the engagements and all that stuff. And I just get to do my work and then shut it off because it's, it, I get caught in a loop too and it's not productive. And then I'll just turn on my phone. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I don't need to go check if somebody wrote me a message, they can wait till tomorrow. But I think also like in my position, another one, sometimes you feel like they can just, people can just access you now, mm -hmm. you know, and then they expect a response. And so it puts me in a bit of a pickle. <laughs> so it's like, I don't want to ignore you, but I also want to go sit outside and do nothing. Right. Uh, what do you, you right. know, I want, and you said something earlier that was so important just about engaging in life and nature. Like when you go outside and you take a photo or you engage in your community or you, um, do an activity in nature or anywhere without technology, you're engaging in reality. When you are looking at a screen and watching TV and looking at your phone and playing a game and scrolling, you are engaged in a virtual reality, something that is not right. even real. And so the lessons come from uh, the real world, the understanding, but now it's considered boring and, you know, all that kind of thing. So, um, I think you've made a lot of excellent points. Please continue. It's what I love about photography. I love the alternating nature of photography. Photography gets me out into the world. It takes me to places. I meet people that I never would have met without photography. You know, the other day I had occasion to um, photograph uh, uh, former President Obama. I, I would never meet people or be out in the world, many of the places I go if I were not taking pictures. So I love the opportunity. The camera gives me an opportunity to more intensely experience the world itself. And then on the other hand, in the old days of the darkroom, or currently with the digital lab, it brings me back to myself, to a solitary activity where I'm sitting with the computer or in the old days working in a dark room. So that alternation between solitary involvement and being deeply engaged in the world is what I, what I personally really love about photography. Yep, it's both ends. I think that you need that. You need, that's I think what people aren't getting is that solitary time, um, right. whether you want to call it meditation or mindfulness or just being with yourself and you can do it in different ways. That's why people love extreme sports. They like surfing because they're, you have to be in the present moment. That's why you like snowboarding. That's why people like skateboarding and sport. Um, but having some sort of activity where it's just you and yourself and your thoughts and you can kind of go in and you have a bit of a filtering process. And I think it's very important for us um, as human beings, because if you're just always consuming, you're not really aware of what you're thinking, how you're feeling. You're not as present or engaged um, without a practice like that. It can even be cooking. You can be present cooking. You know, in Zen, they give the same reverence to um, sweeping the floors as they do to meditation. It's like bring the yeah. same level of presence there. You can do that. I think that, that inward attention is so important. You know, I need to be able to have a, a lucid and stable presence within myself rather than being dragged here and there by all of the stimulations of the outer world. You know, I think that any of these activities, photography, surfing, certainly, we have a lot of surfers here on this island. And all of these activities bring us back to ourselves in this moment. And we're able to witness, mindfully witness, what has gone within, and we're able to engage an activity that is going on without. And in that relationship, that, that magic 
between the inward attention and the out, outward engagement is, I think, where the energy of most arts and sports lie. Yeah, yeah, David, I totally agree. I think that everything that you shared was super practical and definitely deep Zen lessons because usually I'm a little bit more on point with reflecting. I was just kind of stunned a few times. We're like, just keep talking because I'm, I'm in my own mind thinking about these lessons and just analyzing them. Um, I, I'll ask you one more question and, and also um, feel free if there's anything that you wish that I had asked or you want to talk about uh, elaborate as long as you wish. I just want to be mindful of the time for you. But um, just a general recommendation for like a young creative or a person like so many people, I don't think utilize art, you know, in schools, I remember being a, a kid and them like taking like less, um, less money for art. And I was like, yeah, I kind of was like, well, we should do art, but I didn't understand it. Now I'm like, we need way more money for arts, music, creativity, you know, that we have to have that as functional human beings otherwise we become basically robots putting zeros and ones there's got to be some way that you express yourself martial arts you know that's one way to do it it's a, it's a more aggressive way to do it but there's also softer ways you know and martial well, arts also for me, tai chi yeah exactly which is softer <laughs> yeah yeah and so you know for me that was basically what taught me how to be a human being you know, if I didn't have martial arts, I wouldn't be the person that I am right now. And I, I apply, even Bruce Lee said it, he's like, I see everything in life, like through the martial arts perspective, you know, and you could learn that in painting and music and anything else. I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the need for art and creativity in the schools because I could talk for hours on that. But I do want to respond to what you're saying about everyone is creative. Picasso said, everyone is an artist. The question is remaining one when we grow up. So we don't need to have a studio. We don't need fancy equipment in order to be creative. I think there's everyday ways that all people can engage creativity based on their own predilections. One of the most powerful ways is simply keeping a journal, writing every day. Julia Cameron in The Artist's Way calls that your morning pages. It's a way of stimulating your creativity. It's a way of stimulating the deeper mind. I think photography is accessible to everyone. Almost everyone in the first world, in the civilized world, has a very professional camera in their pocket right now. <laughs> so we can engage photography without any specialized equipment or even without specialized skill, these things are almost foolproof. They're literally point and shoot. And then there's a whole variety of physical activities where you might need a teacher, but you don't need equipment. I don't think you need much equipment for martial arts. I don't think you need much equipment for things like Tai Chi. So I think that there's many activities that we can engage in that will bring us back to ourselves in the right way and will help us learn to become more whole and more complete as human beings. And I wish everyone would, would find access to one of those things based on what's right for them. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, David, I want to thank you for your time and coming on the show and sharing all of your your work. Um, I'm going to throw in a bonus question, kind of like a, an ender, but what, what would you, if you could install a belief or an idea in everybody's mind on the planet, like what, what do you feel like would be the most empowering message or belief that one could embody to navigate this life with a little bit um, more ease and connection? I don't know if my answer is going to have more ease, but the answer that I would give is the same answer that the playwright president of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel, gave when he gave his first address to the U.S. Congress. He said, the only way that our lives will change for the better on this earth is through a revolution in consciousness. 
We need to look beyond my life, my job, my family, and look toward an order of being where we become conscious of life's unity. And I would say that that message, that consciousness alone can change our lives for the better, would be the message I'd want to leave with everyone. That's a wonderful answer. I'm super stoked I threw in that bonus question. Um, well, before I let you go, where can people find more about you and your work and your book and all that kind of stuff? I have a website and a blog. Both the website and the blog can be accessed through my website, which is uh, www.creativeguide.com. And that has um, my photography, my books, aspects of my teaching. Zen Camera is my most recent book. It's been out now for literally one year. Its publication anniversary date was February 13th. And the book is available in many bookstores and certainly uh, from all the online sources. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. You're like a photography Zen master. Um, I'm excited to go through your book. I've looked at some of your photos and they're absolutely outstanding. I invite everybody to check out your book, check out your work, listen to, you know, what you're sharing. And, you know, if you're uh, already a creative to do it with even more um, self-assurance and empowerment. And if you're not doing anything creative, find a medium that works for you to express yourself and create um, cause it's a beautiful thing. So thank you, Matt. You're a great interviewer. I've really enjoyed this past hour. Ah, I appreciate that. So thank you for having me on the show. My pleasure. Well, thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you in the next episode. Peace.